And so I was surprised. Then I gave a presentation a little over a year ago in Nashville on this issue and talked about it and was really surprised at the reaction of our, it was a prophecy conference, so Christians were there. But I was very surprised at how all of my brothers and sisters in Christ responded to this. And there were so many people who were really shocked, even though a lot of them had seen our Secret Mystery series. And I, I mean, I, I freely admit, when I was working on this documentary, and this actually became part four in that series, uh, and this is the last one that we completed, I was stunned at a lot of the information that I learned. And so what I want to do, wait a sec, here we go. I want to tell you why I think this is an important issue today before I give you some of the, some of the background on this. Uh, we've all probably paid attention to Glenn Beck's Take Back America program. And what he did, I mean, now he's going to be off Fox News. But uh, Beck paid a lot of attention to the Founding Fathers. And, of course, he's been working with a number of uh, teachers like Peter Lilback, David Barton, and others who are promoting the idea of the Founders as having been God-fearing men who were trying to set forth, supposedly, a Christian nation. Uh, and I think this is a very important issue. Here's another picture now. They, they're getting ready to do this rally in Israel, okay? And they're using the fact that Christians in our country have a love for Israel and the Jewish people uh, to have this rally there. And here we see uh, Glenn Beck and David Barton over there in Israel wearing the Jewish head caps uh, getting ready for this rally. Now, the problem with this is that Glenn Beck is not a Christian. Beck's a Mormon. And for those who are familiar with his book, Seven Wonders That Will Change Your Life, he, he openly denies the gospel in that book. Now, a lot of Christians seem to have thought that Beck, uh, well, because he's a Mormon, well, maybe he might be a Christian. Maybe he was some kind of a traditional Mormon or something like that. But in reality, Beck says in that book that he investigated Mormonism extensively. Okay, that he investigated it and he came to the uh, understanding and the belief that Mormonism is the truth. It's not. Amen. It's not. <laughs> Joseph Smith was not a true prophet. And when we all die and stand before God on Judgment Day, we're not going to stand before Joseph Smith. Amen. Um, even though, but that's, that's the conclusion that Beck had to come to. And he openly denies the gospel. He denies that there's a lake of fire. He's denying chief tenets of the Christian faith. Yet he and Barton are working together, and they're using this founding father issue to bring Christians in and join their ecumenical army to supposedly take back America. Okay, so now I just want to give that to you as a backdrop why I think this is important information, why I think it's important to us as believers today. Okay, now I want to start, I want to go over some of the history of the American Revolution and what the faith of the Founding Fathers, the Revolutionary Fathers, really was. But I want to start with this because I think it's very important. This is Charles Thompson. Charles Thompson uh, is a little-known founder, but very important. He was a Congressional Secretary, and he was the man who made the final decisions for the design of the Great Seal of the United States, which many of us are familiar with. There were three SEAL committees. He was in charge of the third committee, and he's the guy who actually made the final decisions for the all-seeing eye of the pyramid, uh, and then the eagle and the shield, and so on. He's the one who made those decisions. Well, he was, because he was the congressional secretary, he was familiar with all of the leading figures in, during the American Revolution. Very familiar with them. And he wrote a detailed history of the events, the motives, and you know, the things that went on uh, in the Continental Congress uh, during the Revolution and after the Revolution and so on. And his friends encouraged him to publish this history because he was known as a very honest, very reliable man. And it was, uh, it was said that his history, from those who had read it, was more detailed and more accurate than any of the other histories that were being published. But Thompson refused to publish the history. And here's what he said. He said, no, he said, I ought not, for I should contradict all the histories of the great events of the revolution. 
let the world admire the supposed wisdom and valor of our great men. Perhaps they may adopt the qualities that have been ascribed to them, and thus good may be done. I shall not undeceive future generations. I shall not undeceive future generations. So as I say in my film, since we are the future generation, we're here, what is it that we may have been deceived about? What is it that Thompson was hiding? And the reason I show this is to, is to show you, uh, brethren, that American history has been manipulated from the beginning. It's been to some extent. Now, we don't know to what extent, because what ends up happening is Charles Thompson burned his historical record. And this is not conspiracy theory. This is, this is provable history. Provable history. So the question I always ask whenever I talk about this issue, because some people think that I believe somehow or other that America has no Christian heritage. They'll give that kind of a statement. That's simply not true. I believe that all, all of us here who love the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth, we are part of America's Christian heritage. Amen. The fact that we're here, the fact that we believe God, the fact that we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that He died on the cross for our sins, we're part of America's Christian heritage. And there have been Christians here from the beginning, uh, but when I, you know, when, when we say the founding of America, there's the founding of America, and then there's the founding of the United States, the government, it, the current government. And so I always draw a distinction between the Plymouth Colony that began in 1620, and then the American Revolution that happened in 1776. And you'll notice there's 150 years between the two of them. If we were to go back 150 years in our own history right now, that takes us back to roughly the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. There's a lot that's happened in our country over the last 150 years. And so the point I make is that the American revolutionaries were very different from the Puritan pilgrims. And when you go to some of these uh, Patriot Christian websites, and they're promoting the idea of America as a Christian nation, You'll often find they'll they'll start quoting some of your early colonists and colonial leaders and so on, and I and and I would agree. If you read uh, the history of the Plymouth Plantation, uh, written by William Bradford Bradford, who came over on board the Mayflower, he was clearly a Christian man. Uh, these were the people who ultimately founded Harvard University in 1636. The Declaration of Harvard was "Truth for Christ and the Church." That was its original motto. And they said at Harvard, uh, they said, every student shall earnestly consider that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And they will quote John 17, 3. And it says, therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation for all sound knowledge and learning. Praise the Lord. And that was their open declaration. Every student, if you come to Harvard University, this is why you're here, to know God and Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate aim of your education. Because the early educators believed that knowledge and education without the Bible was not only a waste of time, but it was potentially dangerous. Martin Luther had famously said that if the gospel is not preached in our schools, they will become the very gates of hell. Look at what's happened in our time. So... The early educators, all of our early uh, Pilgrim Puritan colleges, universities, <coughs> schools, and so on, I mean, the reason we teach reading in our society today is because of the old Deluder Satan Act, it was called. And it was, it was an act that uh, commanded that every town and city and so on that developed a certain number of people in it, they had to hire a schoolmaster to teach the children how to read so they could read the Bible. And it began, it being one chief object of that old deluder Satan, to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures as in former times, and then proceed from there. Because they remember the centuries past in the Dark Ages when the Bible had been outlawed by the popes and forbidden. And people were, you know, it was illegal to own or read a Bible. And that, you know, what, one of the things that we've forgotten in our time today 
is that the term dark age, that term was derived from the fact that the Bible, the word of God, the light had been outlawed. And that's why you know Bradford in his uh, history of the Plymouth Plantation talks about how God had chosen England, he believed, to shine the light of the gospel through the darkness of that time because the light of God's word had been uh, covered up or forbidden, if you will. And so darkness fell over the land. Okay. Do we question professors of faith? Many of us here know this, praise the Lord. Uh, but some people hold the opinion. I remember watching this when uh, Barack Obama was running for president. There were people who, because many people don't receive the idea that Barack Obama is a Christian. They have a real problem with that because of the, the issues that he stands for. And so they have a problem with his confession. And I remember watching a, a CNN reporter uh, get very angry and all uh, very zealous about the idea that you should never question somebody's faith. If they say they're a Christian, you ought to accept it in this kind of thing. And no matter what, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are from God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And as we know, we're, we're commanded in Jude to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, ungodly men, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And what's Jude warning us about? He's not really warning us, as I heard one pastor preach it, he said, you know, look, Satan doesn't need to deceive the Muslims and the Hindus and the Buddhists. He doesn't need to deceive them. He doesn't need to deceive atheists. Why? Because they're already deceived. If Satan's going to work to deceive somebody, he needs to deceive the church. He needs to get inside the body of Christ and start working inside the churches. Because that's the, that's the real threat. That's the danger. Okay. So as we go over now, we're going to talk about some of the key figures in the American Revolution. Some of the key figures. When Glenn Beck began his whole Take Back America movement, he began by having this actor come out. I don't know if you guys remember this. But he had this actor who came out, and he was the ghost of Thomas Paine. And it was as though Thomas Paine had come back from the dead to talk to the American people. And he gave all these rousing, you know, patriotic... Uh, uh, tirades going on and on about how your country's in trouble, you've got the liberals doing this and you've got that and all this other kind of stuff, all this political rhetoric. Okay, as though that would be the advice that we would get from Thomas Paine. He was lifting up Thomas Paine as though this was somebody that we ought to listen to, an oracle of wisdom. Thomas Paine, but who was Paine and what did he really believe about Christianity? Well, let's talk about his influence in the revolution. First, he wrote the pamphlet Common Sense. The pamphlet Common Sense is what spurred the American colonies to fight the War of Independence. There had been skirmishes going on from 1773 to 1776, okay, between the Continental Army and the British, but they were, they were over uh, the rights of the colonists. And so they were having a bunch of debates, but they were not fighting to separate from England. Then Paine comes on the scene, and he writes this pamphlet anonymously, and within less than a year, uh, he's calling now, in the pamphlet, he's calling for a war of independence. Now, we don't need to debate anymore with England. We need to separate from them entirely and draft our own declaration of independence. That's one of the things that he called for in the pamphlet, Common Sense, was for a declaration of independence. Uh, he also wrote, and after the, the uh, war broke out full on, a lot of us don't realize how much discouragement, how much defeat Washington and his men faced in the early part of the war. And so a lot of people were discouraged, and they, they began to think this was a really bad idea. And so Paine began to write the Crisis Series. And so he wrote all of these rousing papers.